What I'd like to do is talk about some adventures that we've had chasing the uh, National Weather Service radio zones and the advantages and uh, the fun in doing that. Um, to put uh, faces with the names, um, myself and uh, Larry, N0NDM, are going to be um, uh, telling you our adventures. Larry, are you there? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Excellent. Yeah. All right. Great. Very good. So uh, just some, some faces here. But um, the advantage here is that the National Weather Service, and for you Europeans, um, this happens over in Europe um, <clears throat> as well. Uh, slightly different hardware, but um, there's a lot of stuff uh, available to you. Um, the National Weather Service launches balloons from 69 different places here in the continental United States and uh, 23 additional places in uh, um, Alaska, the Pacific, and Puerto Rico. And if you happen to be near one of these, um, you can um, track these down. And the Weather Service doesn't want them back at this point, so you get to keep them. Um, here's the locations uh, in the continental United States um, that are available um, or that are launched. And there are two balloons a day, one at, uh, zero UTC and one at 12 UTC, and they launch about an hour before that. So they're up at close to the top at those times. Um, and um, I'll show you how you can tell if they're coming your direction or if they're, uh, they're near you and uh, you can take advantage of these. Um, here's a map that uh, shows um, all of North America and you can see the various locations um, that they're launched from. And we happen to be lucky here in Denver, they launch one from near the old Stapleton Airport. Um, and they generally go out to the east of Denver and we can um, run out there and uh, chase them. What the Weather Service does is they collect information with these balloons, uh, temperature, pressure, um, dew point, um, and location from which they can get the wind information. And they put it together into this fairly obscure looking plot. Um, temperature is across the bottom, but the temperature lines go diagonally at 45 degrees. Um, it's an interesting plot. The wind information over on the right is um, interpretable. Um, but I was told by a PhD from NOAA that if you understand this plot well, you will understand the thermodynamics of the atmosphere and weather. And I'm far from it, but um, <laughs> this is pretty interesting. But this is what the uh, Weather Service collects. And if you notice on the left, it only goes up to about 16,000 meters, which is about 50, what, 57,000 feet. So the Weather Service is only interested in collecting data on the way up to that altitude. And then they don't really care. At that point, it does go on up to um, the, the balloons burst at around 100,000 feet. Average here in Denver is about 106,000 these days. Um, and then they come back down. Sometimes the beacons um, don't make it all the way back down to the ground. They fail. But uh, the Weather Service apparently doesn't care. We do. Larry? Okay. Okay. Why, why do we do this? Well, we're, we're, all, uh, we're all balloon people, and we like to chase balloons, we like to launch balloons, but uh, this is kind of uh, why, we, uh, why we do the radio songs. Next. And um, I'm the uh, Edge of Space Sciences uh, uh, fill and launch guy. So a lot of our, our balloon flights require a lot of hydrogen because we're, we're launching uh, large 3,000 gram balloons. And many times uh, we launch several um, 3,000 gram balloons. So it requires lots of hydrogen. And uh, so here's, our, here's a, a photo of our trailer with uh, loaded down with hydrogen. So with, um, the, um, with all of the hydrogen, we have a trailer to carry that around. And that's really not conducive for me to go tracking. And uh, so I, I, I end up at the launch site for most of the flights, which is fine. I enjoy that as well. But um, there's a lot of preparation that goes into our, our flights. Uh, next slide. And uh, so here's a launch. Uh, this one was from, uh, from Deer Trail. 
so we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of people at the launch site. Um, Tate requires a lot of coordination to uh, to get it off. You guys should be familiar with most of that, and so um, it can be a little tense, uh, somewhat organized chaos to uh, to get the balloons up into the air. But um, the radio sons, I don't have to uh, to go and pick up the, the hydrogen at air gas. I, I don't have to fill the balloon. I don't have to launch the balloon. And uh, so it's a lot easier for me and more fun because I'm more engaged in the recovery of the radio son balloon without all of the the expense and the preparation in, in, in doing this. So for me, it's, it's a lot more fun. It's, uh, I, I, again, I get to chase the balloon, I get to recover the balloon without a lot of the, uh, the preparation and, and hassle to do that. Uh, next. And I am retired. So, uh, so is Jim, Marty there and uh, Mark in the photo. So for us retired guys, we, we have the time to, uh, to go out and, and do this. And so it's kind of a, um, a retirement um, fun thing to do and uh, do some of the things that, uh, that we like to do and which is uh, why we're doing the radio songs. All right, Jim, back to you. Uh, our inspiration for uh, doing this um, started with uh, one of our guys at EOSS, uh, Jeff, he started tracking the radio sons in the morning with the idea of uh, using that wind data to refine our predictions for our EOSS launches. Um, he doesn't go out and recover them, but what he does is he tracks them from his uh, home QTH and uh, posts them on the web. And um, using the EOSS software, he collects the, the wind information. I don't know if it's being used in our predictions or not, but um, we were watching these every day. He got interested in that. And then Mark Connor at this uh, GPSL last year gave a talk on chasing uh, weather balloons from his um, home. And he cited that he uses a couple of pieces of software, Radio Sound, Auto RX, and Chase Mapper. And um, I tracked those down and um, they're very convenient and um, uh, perfectly set up for this application. So uh, we started, um, or I started getting going on that and then got Larry going with me. And then uh, Mike, our um, web host here today, gave a talk last year. He uses, um, or he tracks the radio zones. The difference is uh, in his part of the country, the radio zones are on 1680 megahertz. Um, here in Denver, they're on 400 megahertz. So the antennas are a little bit different. Um, they need to use helical antennas. We can use omnidirectional antennas. And he's um, up in the Finger Lakes region in upstate New York. So this is the um, Edge of Space Sciences uh, kiosk, which uh, I think some of you are very familiar with. Uh, this is put out by, by Jeff, uh, N2XGL. He, um, he has a base station receiver to receive the radio sons. And so he then takes that, that data and puts it out on the EOSS kiosk on the World Wide Web. Uh, you can see the URL there if you uh, want to visit that sometime, track.eoss.org. So this is a snapshot um, showing the um, last night's radio son flight. And of course, the pink is the uh, ascent. And that uh, gray dot there is the burst at 108,000 feet. And then we have uh, the descent. So when I took this snapshot, the, the flight was still in progress. So the balloon, of course, had not landed. And, uh, but you can see the, uh, the little black X with the dot in the middle there. That is the predicted landing. So uh, Jeff also provides um, uh, predictions as well as the uh, uh, progress of the balloon and the uh, predicted landing there. Um, Jeff also has his base station set up to, to track two 
separate radio signs. So over there in the left, you'll see a, a zero, zero, zero. That's the first radio sign that uh, his software starts tracking. And then zero, zero, uh, okay, zero, zero, zero is the first one. Zero, 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 one is actually the second balloon. So this can do two plots of two, um, two radio sons in the air at the same time. Uh, for the most part, there's really only one in the air. As Jim mentioned, sometimes there will be a failure and uh, the weather service will then launch a second balloon. And that first balloon can come back and start transmitting. So um, having two receivers uh, really is kind of a good idea for, uh, for Jeff. We also have other people in the metro area that launch radio sons. The um, uh, NOAA in Boulder will launch some sons, which they're looking for uh, carbon dioxide or ozone and things like that. There's also another company, which we're not quite sure who that is, up in Loveland, that will launch radio sons occasionally. So, two sons in the air at the same time, while not really super common. Oops, we lost his audio. Oh, okay, my back. Yes. Okay, all right. Um, not sure where I left off. I don't know how I got muted. No, you were good. Okay. Just lost a second or two. Okay, all right. So, um, so anyway, it's it it is quite. It does happen where there's two radio sons in the uh, in the air at the same time. So being able to track two is is a good idea. Next. Whoops, I lost my, uh, there we go. Okay, uh, recovery. There are some parts of the country, as most of you know, which recovering any balloon, as well as a radio sign can be rather difficult. So this is up in, in New York, uh, where the Finger Lakes are. So you can see trying to recover a radio sign in crossing those lakes can be quite difficult task to do, depending upon which side of the lake you're on and which side of the lake the radio sign lands. So some areas of the country can be very difficult in doing that. However, in Colorado, next slide. In Colorado, most of the signs will go to the east of the uh, uh, Denver area which are pretty much treeless for the most part. So we don't have, um, we don't have a difficulty recovering things. It's, it's, it's really quite easy. Um, although sometimes the signs will go to the west, they will go up into the mountains, uh, they will go south, southeast, um, and sometimes they'll go a long, long way. So we, we get to kind of pick and choose which ones we're going to go pursue, which ones we're going to go chase. Uh, but for the most part, um, the balloons are pretty easy to recover. Uh, next slide. Okay, we're going to get into some hardware here. And uh, your, your system can be very simple, and it can become more complex. And you can add the complexity to it later on after you're familiar with it, after you've done some cases and recoveries, you can, you can modify your, your, your system. So for a, a, a simple setup, we can uh, use either a Raspberry Pi 3 or a Raspberry Pi 4. And it requires a software-defined radio. So an RTL SDR is what we use. Uh, we get them from New Electric, New Elect or Electric. We'll uh, we'll have some links to that later. Uh, the RTL is um, is the chip that that's in there uh, in the SDR, and um, a GPS antenna because when you're when you're out driving around, you kind of need to know where you're at in relation to where the balloon is. And you're going to need a, a UHF antenna. Uh, next slide. So here's a, a, a photograph of Jim's simple hardware. He's got a, um, a magnetic 
mount antenna there uh, with the um, little uh, teardrop or Hershey's Kiss mount there. Uh, that actual antenna that he's using is a, is a dual band ham radio antenna, which does work. So most of us already have a dual band or a, a, a UHF antenna. Uh, that will work just fine. Um, I have something that's a little more cut for the frequency of the radio song, but uh, you don't have to go out and, and, and uh, spend a lot of money. Some of this stuff you've already got. So he's got a simple uh, magnetic mount antenna there. That then goes to the, um, the SDR. And uh, then we've got a USB cable that comes out of there and goes into the Raspberry Pi. And uh, then there's his uh, USB GPS um, for uh, his location. Uh, next slide. So a, a Raspberry Pi, you know, being a small computer, most computers, you gotta have some way of viewing what's on the computer. So with a Raspberry Pi and when we're mobile, we, we kind of go in what's kind of like a headless mode on the Raspberry Pi. So we don't have a monitor connected. We're out in the car driving around. Uh, monitor's obviously too big. So you need something, uh, another device to, to, view the, um, to view what's going on with, uh, with the chase. And that can be either a tablet or it can be a, a computer. Um, we have internet access on our phones, which we'll talk about some more, but you don't have to have an internet connection when you're out chasing. You will need an internet connection when you get your Raspberry Pi set up and you'll need internet connectivity when you're uh, downloading the predictions before the chase. So you're gonna have to have some type of a, an in-car Wi-Fi signal. So the, uh, the Raspberry Pi actually will put out a, a Wi-Fi signal and your tablet or your computer can then connect to that and uh, you'll be able to view the maps and what's going on with the balloon. I, uh, I use a, a router in my, in my vehicle and um, I found that the little router works pretty good. It's a 12 volt travel router and uh, I use that to, um, to make my connection to the Raspberry Pi. So I've got an ethernet cable that goes from the Pi to my router. And then I, I connect my, my, um, my tablet to the, uh, to the router. And that's how, I, that's how I view it. So on this slide, uh, you'll see there's my, my, uh, my router, which I have Velcroed to the back window. And then my, my two GPSs, uh, the reason I have two is another story, but uh, there's the GPS pucks that are also taped to the window. And uh, there's a tablet there on the left, which is uh, connected to the Raspberry Pi. Uh, that blue square there, that is Jim's router that he uses. Uh, and you can see the ethernet cable going to the, uh, to the Pi. Okay, next one. Okay, if you're gonna do a base station like, like Jeff has, um, he uses a, 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 a preamp and a tuned antenna. So next one. So um, there's a, a picture there of a, of a preamp of, of gyms. I do not own a preamp. I have not found the need for it. But if you're, you, you're setting this up as a base station, you probably would want a preamp because as the balloon obviously gets farther away from you and you're not tracking the, uh, the balloon. So um, sensitivity is, is pretty vital. So you might wanna get a, um, a preamp. They're about 50, $60 for the preamp. So uh, he's got the antenna going into the preamp that then goes to the SDR and then to the Raspberry Pi. And rather than a, a um, ham radio dual band antenna, you probably want to go with a good base station antenna that's tuned specifically for the uh, 400 megahertz, 401 megahertz, which is what the, uh, the radio sun transmits on. 
But uh, I, when I first set up my Raspberry Pi, I did it here in the shack and I used the dual band ham radio antenna that's on my roof and it worked just fine. But uh, again, if you're gonna set up the base station long-term, you probably want a, a dedicated antenna specifically for, the, uh, for that frequency. Next. Okay, we kind of talked about two, uh, two radio sons in the air at the same time. And uh, having a dual receiver set up is what Jim and I have, have done. Um, so we have added a second SDR to our, our system. So when there are two up in the air, if the first SON fails, like Jim mentioned, uh, the, rate, the weather service really only cares of getting data up to about 50, 60,000 feet. And if the balloon uh, transmitter fails or pops or whatever the issue is, they don't, they don't send up a second one. But if the balloon, uh, if the radio son will fail uh, earlier, they'll send a second radio son up. Well, that first radio son could come back to life later on. And so we've experienced some issues with two radio sons that we're trying to chase or view or watch and uh, things get confusing. So by adding the second um, SDR, it, um, it allows us to, uh, to see both at the same time on, on the same screen. And you can add um, several SDRs if you want to add a third or fourth, the, the software can certainly handle that. So again, you'd need uh, two antennas, one for each SDR. Um, the photograph of the white truck there, that's mine. I, I have an aluminum vehicle, so magnets don't stick to it. So I cannot use the magnetic mount antennas. I've got to go with a, a dedicated antenna. So that's a, that's a picture of my quarter wave uh, SDR antenna. I actually have two. I have another one over there on the right side of the vehicle. But my stuff is, is hardwired into the vehicle and that I'm not moving things around. Jim kind of sets his vehicle up and uh, sets it up for the, for the chase ahead of time. And uh, he puts all this stuff in his back, in the, the back of his vehicle. Uh, my stuff is pretty well stationary. I can take it out. I can, uh, I can put it back in, but um, it's ready to go and stays in the vehicle for the most part. And uh, so having my, um, my stuff kind of mounted, I, I need to still connect to the internet to download the predictions. So that's why I use that um, travel router, that GLINet travel router. And because that travel router has two transmitters in it. So it will also act as a, as a repeater for my home Wi-Fi. So I can sit in my driveway. Um, the router will connect to my home Wi-Fi. I can then connect to the Raspberry Pi. And I can download the predictions from my driveway. Uh, I don't have to take anything out and ready to go. Once I leave the house, that router will also switch over to my, my iPhone and use the hotspot on my iPhone to connect to the internet. Um, and so that's kind of handy to do that as well. And um, having the, um, the internet when I am out there, um, you don't need it once you've downloaded the um, predictions. But I found it's, it's useful to have the internet out there while we're chasing. And uh, we'll get uh, maps that are satellite view and the satellite view maps can be, can be handy because um, the road maps sometimes don't give you that down to earth detail. So it's kind of nice to have uh, internet out there in the field but you certainly don't need it. All right, Jim, next. Okay, let me talk a little bit about the software um, that uh, we're using. Radio Sound Auto RX and Chase Mapper are both available on uh, GitHub. If you uh, just Google on those terms, uh, the first thing that pops up is the GitHub. And then when you 
scroll down through the GitHub, the first stuff is a list of files. But if you scroll down, then you get into the text that really explains what's going on. Um, the, the software is written by a couple of Australian guys. Uh, Mark Jessup of EK5QI is um, uh, the lead. And then uh, Michael Wheeler um, is uh, VK3FUR is very much involved in it. And the two of these guys have written um, some really nice software. And um, it, it is um, a Linux system. Um, don't let that scare you. There's a little bit of command line um, work that needs to be done, but they have now put together what's called a Docker image. And Docker is a, a pretty slick setup where they have prepackaged the software in a uh, image. And then you just put onto your Raspberry Pi the Docker um, infrastructure, which is a half a dozen command lines. And then you download the uh, image and it brings down all of the various parts and pieces of the, the radio zoned auto RX um, software. So you don't have to go through and compile anything. You don't have to go through and put in all the uh, dependencies and uh, things like that. So it works out pretty well. Um, radio zoned RX is a piece of software that was written specifically for um, uh, tracking radio zones, and uh, in there are the uh, capability to track many different types of radio zones, including uh, the European, many European ones, as well as um, the ones that are used here in the U.S. So, um, for you. Uh, Europeans that are on here, this is very much a possibility for you as well. Um, what Radio Zoned RX does is it uses a utility called RTL Power to scan the frequency range that you put, um, you define. And for me, it's 400 through 403 megahertz. And uh, what it does is it goes through there and it detects any peaks that it finds. When it finds those peaks, it uses a utility that they have written to uh, study each of those peaks and determine if it's a radio zone, and if so, what type of radio zone it is. And if it determines that it is a radio zone signal, it will then start up a demodulator um, decoder for that radio zone. And they have many of them available. Um, and it will start uh, decoding it and uh, set off um, a task off to the side that will decode that. Um, radio zone. Then it'll go back and start scanning again. Um, if you have two SDRs, um, it'll hand off the um, decoding to the second SDR and go back and scan again. If uh, you only have one SDR and it detects a radio zone, it'll dedicate that SDR to uh, detecting that. Um, radio zone Auto RX uh, does have a browser interface. And it also has a web interface. It will feed the information to um, APRS.FI, and it will also um, send it to HabHub. Um, it also generates a browser interface, which allows you to look at the uh, Radio Sound RX um, output and see what's going on. Here you can see the browser interface. Uh, the very top portion is. Um, what uh, version is running and what task is running. And you can see, you know, is that the fourth line down? It says current task, SDR um, radio zone or SDR zoned. That's the idea of the SDR is currently scanning. And right below that, there's a line that will populate with the information from the radio zone if one is detected. Uh, you can see the scan there that's occurring and it's found two peaks above its detection level and it's analyzing those peaks. And then below that is a map. And that map will show the radio zone where it is. Now this map is connected to the uh, internet. So if you're running a base station or if like Larry said, you're connected with a, a hotspot or something out in your car, you can use this map to um, see where the radio zone is. Uh, Chase Mapper actually does a much better job of that. I'll talk about that in a second. But um, this is a fairly neat piece of software that um, um, is designed specifically for working with these radio zones. 
Um, here's the radio zone, different types of radio zones that we uh, experience here in the US. The National Weather Service uses either the uh, Visala uh, radio zones or the Lockheed Martin radio zone. And then the, um, the GRA, the DFM 09, that's the Canadian um, radio zone. And for those of you that are up near the um, northern part of the United States, you may experience some of these uh, Canadian ones. Now the decoders um, decode various amounts of information from the radio zones. They all decode the position of the radio zone, which is what we need for uh, tracking purposes. And you can see that uh, the Visala um, radio zones detect everything, the temperature, pressure, humidity, um, as well as the position. But um, for the Canadian and especially for the Lockheed Martin um, ones, um, the detectors cannot detect the temperature, humidity, and pressure information. And I don't know if that's um, because it is carefully encrypted or if it's because uh, Lockheed Martin has just not shared their um, encoding scheme um, with the public. But uh, nobody to date has been able to psych this out and figure out the temperature and the pressure. It would be neat to have that information, um, although not necessary. If the information is available, the radio sound auto RX software actually will generate one of those skew T plots. So you can uh, look at that information. Um, I did take a look at the Lockheed Martin decoder software to see what it was doing, see if I could figure out anything about temperature and pressure. Turns out it, all the comments in the software are in German. So I would have to do a little uh, decoding of my own there. Okay, Chase Mapper, the other piece of software um, runs concurrently on the Raspberry Pi and it receives uh, data via TCP or the, uh, the UDP packets that uh, Mike was talking about earlier. And so Radio Sound RX actually transmits information um, out and, and um, any number of pieces of software could use it. In this case, Chase Mapper takes the information in. Chase Mapper also takes in a GPS um, that you've got in your car. So you can see where your car is on the screen as, as well as how far the balloon is away at what direction, et cetera. Chase Mapper uses a set of maps. And if Chase Mapper is connected to the internet with a hotspot um, or some sort of connection from your car, it will use uh, maps that it, it uh, pulls off the internet and scrolls around as you're driving. If not, you can uh, use offline storage of maps and load the maps into your Raspberry Pi. So I've loaded the maps for the most of the Colorado area that I track in. It's about two and a half gigs of uh, uh, map, uh, map uh, tiles. But with those tiles in there, I can uh, scroll around, I can zoom in on the roads and um, use it for tracking purposes. Now Chase Mapper also does predictions. It will do live predictions. If you are connected to the web, it will go to an API that I'm not familiar with on the web and um, feed it information and pull, pull down predictions. Or you can do offline predictions, which means you've loaded the information into your Raspberry Pi and it will predict um, where the balloon, or it'll predict where the balloon's going to go based on where it is now, what altitude it's at. Um, that offline prediction does require that you download the wind data, the current wind data before you leave in the morning. So what I do is I have the Raspberry Pi here in the house and I plug it into my network and I download the morning wind information and I take it out and put it in the car and the offline predictor that's running on the Raspberry Pi will show where the balloon is going to go. Um, Chase Mapper also has a browser interface so it, um, sends out its information through the um, router that's in the car and I can look at it on my tablet or on my screen. So here's a, um, a picture of the uh, Chase Mapper output. This happens to be in uh, Adelaide, Australia, where uh, the authors are tracking their balloons. 
You can see where their car is with a uh, one kilometer uh, rings around the car. That gets kind of neat when you get in close to the balloon. You can say, okay, it looks like I'm three kilometers to the east of the balloon, et cetera. Um, the blue on the left is the track of where the balloon has been. You can see where the balloon currently is. And then the blue track on the right is the prediction of where the balloon is going to go. The red track is if the balloon were to burst now, here's where it would go. Um, so that's semi-useful. But um, anyway, this, this is a, a real-time um, balloon position and uh, the prediction updates as the balloon moves. Now the prediction is based on the wind data that was downloaded in the morning. It does not collect the wind data as the balloon goes up and use it as the balloon comes down. So uh, um, that's, but, but this works quite well and it will zero in on where the balloon is going to land. You can see up at the top, the data on where the balloon is uh, currently located. And down at the bottom, you can see some more information about uh, this particular balloon. And if multiple balloons are um, being received, down at the bottom, you will have all the balloons um, shown, and you can um, select which one you want to uh, monitor the data on. So this is a pretty neat uh, program, and it does take the information in via these UDP packets. So it would be possible, um, for instance, to to write a uh, program or interface, uh, another um, monitoring program, like maybe these uh, uh, LoRa receivers to this software and use it for uh, tracking. Pretty neat stuff. Okay, the, the radio zones that um, are used here in the US, a variety of different kinds. Um, the, one, the one that we happen to use is the uh, or the one that we happen to experience is the one that's in the center uh, top. That's the um, Lockheed Martin and, and the 400 megahertz is the one that we get. I think Mike uh, uh, has the 1680 megahertz. They look, look the same. Maybe the antenna is a little bit different, but uh, different kinds. And worldwide, there is a lot of radio zoned activities. I think there's about 1300 locations worldwide where radio zones are launched. And um, you can see where folks are receiving these balloons. This is um, HabHub um, receiving the, uh, where the radio zones are being received by various hams, or doesn't have to necessarily be a ham because you're just receiving. Now, um, it turns out that there's enough people collecting enough data many multiple times a day that it, it was a danger of overwhelming hab, hab hub. So uh, what they did is the uh, Australian guys actually created a, um, I don't know if you call it a fork of hab hub called Sound Hub. And Sound Hub is uh, where the information goes strictly for um, these uh, Sound uh, activities. So you can take a look at this sound hub and you can um, find where um, radio zones are being monitored near you. Okay, what does the uh, radio zone look like that we track down and recover? Um, here it is, it's fairly simple. Um, this is, this is it hanging from a branch of a tree outside of my shack. Um, the one thing I did was I sh there's a, usually about a 75 foot string between the parachute and the radio zone. I uh, took that out for this picture. I think the weather service wants the radio zone far enough away from the balloon and the uh, parachute that it doesn't affect temperature and um, humidity readings. They use a, a 48 inch plastic parachute uh, fairly simple. It's just uh, orange plastic and uh, uh, strings um, held on with hot glue. Um, they're all cotton strings, and I think that's so when they land in the field and the cows eat them, it uh, doesn't injure them. Uh, the radio sound itself is uh, fairly small, uh, lightweight. It's made out of um, uh, styrofoam and plastic. 
sure it has, it, it does have circuit board in it and it has uh, three batteries in it, a wire antenna hanging down from the bottom, but um, uh, fairly simple. And the reason they're, these are fairly simple and uh, is because they're disposable. The, the weather service no longer wants them back. They um, just um, let them, uh, leave them out in the field. Here's a, here's a picture of the string. The uh, orange parachute is right up at the top of the picture. And um, uh, there's the, I think this was 55 feet long, but a long string. The temperature sensor is some sort of little, um, I don't know if it's a thermistor or a, um, what it is, but uh, it's held out away from the radio sound on a little arm made out of wire. Uh, the uh, wet bulb sensor has some sort of a, has the temperature sensor and then some sort of little chip in there and it's protected by a plastic cup. But uh, this is, they get the wet bulb information from this. And the whole, the whole uh, radio zone only weighs 210 grams. That's about uh, half a pound. And um, it's a fairly lightweight, simple thing. And it has a, uh, this is a harmless weather instrument statement on the outside of it. And it says, um, please dispose of properly. Um, originally they had a uh, self-addressed return envelope and you can still see the place where it was taped to the um, plastic arms up on top. They've since been taken off. And then for a while, they had a statement on that said, if you find this, please return it. And I've talked to ranchers out in the field that said, oh yeah, we've sent those in before and never gotten any money back. They said they'd, they'd give a reward, but they never did. Um, according to these guys, I'm sure some people have. But uh, now they just say dispose of properly. Okay, the predictions I was talking about, this is kind of interesting. They use the, um, oh, there's uh, Bill Brown holding up a harmless weather instrument uh, picture um, <laughs> from Bismarck, Maryland. So he's got, that looks like an, an LMS-6. Yep, radio sound, exactly. Um, for the predictions, they use the CUSF predictor. That is the, um, oh, shoot, all of a sudden I drew a blank. It is the, um, oh, in England. Um, It'll come to me in a minute. It's tough getting old. Um, Cambridge? Cambridge University Space uh, Program. Yes, and it turns out that is the predictor that is used in HabHub. Um, it, it's uh, available as a binary. Uh, Windows, there's a Windows version of it available out on the web um, that you can load on your machine. And Chase Mapper uses the um, this predictor and and uh, they've written a uh, predictor wrapper that uh, runs it in Python, but um, they have this predictor available. It um, the the wrapper actually collects the wind data from the National Weather Service, and I believe for Europe, um, the National Weather Service uh, global uh, information system would would have the European information in it as well but it collects the wind data and then it runs the CUSF standalone predictor. Um, this is handy. You can have it if, well, you can go to HabHub and you can run it in HabHub or you could have it on your machine and run an individual prediction. I've done that for our EOSS flights. You know, if it bursts at um, 90,000 feet or 100,000 feet or 110,000 feet, where's it gonna land? I've, I've played with that and um, they also have a utility in there or a script in there where you can run a whole week's worth of predictions. And uh, that's kind of neat. Here it is. Um, this is all of the morning predictions for the next week for Denver. And so Larry and I can look at this map and go, um, hey, the one in the uh, far right uh, looks like it would be a handy one close to uh, us. And I check my calendar and I don't have anything going. Larry doesn't have anything going. Uh, we're both going to be up at four o'clock to 
P anyway, so we may as well get in the truck and head on out. So um, we use this to pick a, uh, a radio zone that we want to chase after. Notice the two in the lower left are up in the mountains to the west of Colorado Springs. So we're not going to go after those because those are going to land in the trees. They're probably going to land in areas that don't have roads easily available. So, uh, but anyway, this is kind of neat. This is actually only the morning predictions. The uh, script itself is set up to run all of the morning and all of the evening predictions, but that gets such a mishmash that you really can't see what's going on. But uh, pretty neat stuff. And to have that tool available to you is, is pretty neat. Okay, Radio Sound Auto RX, like I said, does put it onto the web. It puts the information, if you had a base station, for instance, connected to the web, it would post the information to Sound Hub through the Radio Sound Tracker program. It can also uh, post the information to radiosondi.info. It can also post it to aprs.fi, although a lot of the APRS community does not like the idea of posting um, radio zones to APRS because it is such a large amount of information. Um, our Jeff, our uh, guy here at EOSS has set it up so that it goes on to track.eoss.org for the Denver area. And this allows us to, to uh, look at this information. And Radio Sound Auto RX also is set up to um, send an email to you every time it detects a radio zone. So if you're operating at home, you'll get an email that says, oh, the five o'clock launch um, occurred and uh, you know it, it has started. So the, these are all available. Uh, you can have this running from your vehicle if you have a uh, internet connection available. It turns out there's a couple of people in Denver that do this with the radio zones anyway, so there's no need for me to um, put that information out there as well. Okay, we've um, actually done 16 chases so far, and but only 15 recoveries. Uh, we had one in the morning where the, uh, the radio son stopped transmitting. It was about 30,000 feet on the way down. And uh, if I can't receive the radio sound, I can't, I can't. I've got to uh, be able to uh, track it all the way to the ground in order to find it. So um, 16 chases, only 15 recoveries. We, uh, we did one of those uh, in, in the evening and all of the rest were, were early in the morning. Obviously, depending upon the time of the year and the sun, sometimes we got to wait for the sun to rise before we go out and recover the radio sun because we don't want to be out there in, in, uh, in the dark. Uh, that issue with the evening recoveries, uh, again, we've got to make sure we can get out there and get back before the sun sets. So those are some of our, our limiting factors. Next. So here is, um, here is one of our ones that we did in January 30th. This shows the track of, the, um, of us. You'll notice the, uh, the black lines are the, the track of the, the vehicle. This is north of Lyman. So we came up from Lyman on uh, Highway Colorado 71. And uh, we were hanging around in that area because that's where the, our prediction was showing the landing, um, where it actually landed. You can see that in the upper left. And you can see our track going across the, uh, the county roads to, uh, to get there. And then we, uh, that track also shows when we left and went back to Lyman. So that blue line that goes beyond the, uh, the landing the predictor is still running, and once we kind of pick it up and start moving it around, the predictor goes crazy. So you can ignore um, that prediction blue line after the uh, the parachute on these uh, on these slides. Uh, next, so here we are. We're uh, this is the uh, same uh, track flight that we I just showed the the track on. Uh, we were waiting for the sun to come up before we went out there and track. 
And so here's a sunrise picture out there north of Lyman, uh, which I thought was kind of a cool picture. Again, being in January, we, we did have a little bit of snow on the ground. Next. So here is the, uh, the actual recovery of that. Had to climb up a, a little hill that was kind of steep. And then this was on the other side of the ridge. And uh, you can see the parachute there at the top and the flight string down to the radio sun with some, some uh, windmills in the background. Next. Uh, this is one we did uh, June 8th. This was in Hudson, Colorado. And um, this one was kind of unique in that we're hanging around Hudson looking at the prediction and the prediction fluctuated back and forth across Interstate 76. And we were kind of limited, similar to uh, a river or a lake, your access can be limited getting on the other side of that obstacle. So that's what we faced on, on this flight where the prediction was on changing back and forth. So we made a decision uh, that it, we were, it was going to be east of 76. So we went out there, if you follow that black line. And so we're, we're up there on east side of 76. Well, as it actually was landing, it changed and went over on the west side of 76. There was a lot of construction going on in Hudson on the road. So this is where the satellite view came in on the map. So I was able to get in using my uh, hotspot on my iPhone and got the satellite images and discovered that there was a way to go under Interstate 76. And um, that was handy, but we found when we got there that that was really a, a drainage and there was a lot of water, a lot of mud, and the bridge over the interstate was pretty low. So we actually had to remove antennas uh, off of our vehicles to fit underneath there. So that was a slight obstacle. So we, um, we got under 76 and then we were able to, uh, to get to the recovery over there. And next slide. Whoops, hang on. So once we got over there on the other side of 76, this is where the, the sawn landed, uh, right there on a the paved road. It's actually um, kind of a remote area. There wasn't a whole lot of traffic. Nobody had run over it by the time we got over there. And uh, this was obviously a very easy recovery being right there on, on the roadway. Next. And uh, we had a guest with us when we went on this flight. Uh, this is Nolan. Nolan is a cadet at West Point. And he was on a summer uh, adventure out here with the University of Colorado doing some stuff with them. Um, being interested in balloons, high altitude stuff, he, uh, he got a hold of Edge of Space Sciences and said, hey, I'm, I'm gonna be out there in Colorado. I'd like to hook up with you guys. He actually wanted to go on some EOSS flights, but well, he was here, but we didn't have any flights scheduled with EOSS. So Jim and I said, well, let's go do a, let's go do a radio sound. And so Nolan came along with us uh, on, on this recovery. Next. So you can see on this one, as you've all, many of you experienced, you can get fouling of the parachute with the, with the balloon. So obviously, depending upon how, how bad the, the parachute is fouled, you can uh, get a pretty rapid uh, descent rate. And uh, that can affect, obviously, recovery because you thought the original prediction was going to be over here and it ended up being, you know, 10 miles uh, different because of that uh, rapid descent. So you can see a little bit of fouling of the, of the shards there. Next. And so we, uh, this is how we package them up. We fold up the parachute. We uh, kind of wrap the, uh, the flight string around and uh, we gave that trophy, we call them trophies. We gave that one to Nolan so he could take that back to uh, West Point and show off uh, what he did out here in Colorado. Next. 
Okay, this is uh, one we did in Watkins. Watkins is really just east of Denver. And um, it was relatively close. You can see our, our, our track coming in off of uh, Interstate 70 there to Watkins and then south on a county road there. And uh, we kind of went south and uh, down there at the bottom, you can see where we kind of stopped. That was actually a, um, an FAA aircraft. Um, oh, VOR. VOR, thank you, Jim. And uh, we thought it was gonna land right there, but it, it did not. It actually took that curve to the north. So we had to backtrack and then uh, contacted the landowner there on that county road. And then we went out and, and picked it up. Next. And this is where we, we ended up. We were actually able to drive right out there, uh, right to it. So there's Jim's vehicle on the right and my truck on the left. And we're right there at the parachute. Next. And we had, a, we had another guest on this as well. Um, it was uh, Bill, was a friend of Jim's. And so uh, he came out. He's also retired and wanted something to do. So he's, uh, he's actually done a couple of recoveries with us. So uh, next slide there. And uh, there's Bill and I holding that, that, that radio sign. Now, we... Um, we have not actually been able to see any of these land. We've been obviously very close. We think we should be able to see them, but they are rather small. It's white, it's that little small payload uh, and a small parachute. And uh, we're used to seeing the landings with the edge of space science flights, but with these radio signs, maybe it's our old eyes but we, we have not been able to see any of these actually land. Uh, so we're, we're hoping to be able to do that at, at some point. Now, uh, go on to the next one. This was our, our last flight that, uh, that Jim and I did. This, uh, again, we landed near Hudson. This was uh, Friday, June 25th. And uh, so we went to, uh, north and then had to go east and then uh, loop around and uh, you can actually see the, the landing point there. Now notice the prediction is uh, those are range rings. We've got our set for imperial rather than metric. So those are miles. Each one of those range rings are miles. So the prediction was actually uh, when we got down to it was one, two, three, four, like four miles away from where it actually landed. Uh, the prediction that this puts out is to sea level, not to uh, 4,825 feet. So we've got to mentally kind of backtrack a little bit on where we think it's, it's, it's going to land. Uh, some of these flights of uh, the radio sign, once it landed, it kind of disappears into the vegetation. And uh, we were doing one where I almost stepped on it as we're getting closer to it. Uh, notice the um, latitude and longitude, of course, is in the bottom right of the, of the screen. So we can uh, put that latitude and longitude into a GPS and then walk right out to them and, uh, and find them. Um, I have thought about using some direction finding techniques. Uh, I like DFing and uh, the uh, Baofeng radios or the Anytones that have some uh, broadband receivers, you can, uh, you can actually tune in the, the, the frequency of the radio signs and you can actually hear them. Uh, they come in pretty strong uh, when they're up in the air, but uh, I haven't perfected any DF. I don't have a, a Yagi for this frequency. So we really haven't needed to DF because we can uh, go right to it pretty much with the GPS. But I would suggest having, a, a, again, a handheld GPS with you and uh, putting in the latitude and longitude after it's landed or right before it's landed. And then you can walk right out to it to, to help you find it because sometimes they're a little bit hard to see. Next, uh, this is uh, again the um, Hudson one. This is looking back from the recovery back to our vehicles. So it was a slight walk. We don't like to walk a whole lot. 
but um, this one was fairly short. You can see our vehicles in the back next. And uh, this is that flight string of, uh, of that flight. Uh, you can see the radio sign. We're kind of standing at the parachute next. And uh, there's Jim. He's uh, starting to uh, roll up the parachute there and work his way back to the, uh, to the radio sign. So really enjoyed uh, doing the radio signs. Uh, again, EOSS has a, has a reputation of 100% of recovery on all of our flights, even though sometimes that might be a month later. But um, with the radio sons, we don't have that stress if we don't recover it for various reasons, that, that's okay. Uh, we don't really care. Um, so that's why I, I, I enjoy this. It's, it's a lot less stress and I don't have to uh, mess with gas, don't have to launch the balloon. So it's, uh, it's a lot more, uh, more fun, less stressful for me. So uh, thank you guys, appreciate it. Uh, we've got some, some links coming up here. Jim, go ahead and take it. Okay, thank you, yes, for uh, listening to us. And um, I will um, uh, put this uh, list of links um, or send them to Mike and it'll, they'll be posted on the website uh, along with the uh, slides here. So um, give you reference to these various things that we talked about. Appreciate your time and uh, hope this was informative and interesting. Thanks.